Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, everyone. Um, welcome to, to this webinar. I'm uh, Gil Hofer, the co-founder and CTO of Salto. And in this webinar, I'm going to replay a session that I gave at the latest uh, Sweet Board about two months ago. Um, the reception that we got there for that session was very positive, so we thought it would be good for the community at large to replay this, also record this, so we could uh, be able to use it, uh, so you would be able to watch it at later times. So again, welcome everyone. Uh, in this session, I'm going to talk about some newer ideas and their place in a more efficient, more modern way of managing NetSuite configuration. And by doing that, also harnessing the power of DevOps and AI. So let's start with a little bit of context. As you all know, also in your day-to-day, -day, SaaS applications run the modern company. These can be business applications. Uh, for example, for finance, like NetSuite, for a CRM, like Salesforce, for customer support, like Zendesk. And these could be IT applications, uh, such as uh, Jira for development in ITSM or Okta for identity management, etc. But in practice today, any modern company is using at least a few tens, if not a few hundreds of SaaS applications, business and IT applications, to run their business. What used to be a monolithic uh, ERP system about 30 years ago is now a whole set, a whole collection of applications typically consumed from, from the cloud, so SaaS applications. Now, all of these applications require deep customizations, right? And you know it, that's your day-to-day, -day, right? Every company has different requirements because every, every business is slightly different. So in order to be able to use all of those applications, you need to deeply customize them. On the NetSuite side, for example, you will need to create the relevant uh, workflows and then forms and subsidiaries, et cetera. On the Salesforce side, you have a different uh, um, pipeline funnel management uh, process from lead to opportunity to closed one. On the Zendesk side, you have a different process for handling support tickets, et cetera. So all of those business applications require deep customizations. Now, where it starts to get more interesting is when we notice that typically the administrators of those applications tend to be with varying technical expertise. Some of them are coming from with development background or from very technical background, but some of them are typically coming from the business side. So we're looking at analysts, we're looking at uh, ex-accountants, we're looking at uh, manual IT persons. And in order for them to be able to customize those applications, typically no and low code tools and techniques are used Throughout the, throughout the stack. It means that instead of writing code, for example, in NetSuite with Script, you can also use no and local tools, such as the workflows and creating forms graphically and save searches. And there are many capabilities to customize those applications that do not require development expertise and know-how. Now, when we start analyzing that, we realize that these come with, a un with unique challenges of their own. And it shouldn't surprise us because eventually the underlying complexity of the problems that we're trying to solve with those business applications, it doesn't change. It doesn't really matter if we develop a solution using code or no code. Eventually the complexity of the solution, the, the logic behind it, remains the same. So when there is high complexity in the solution that we develop, typically we will see a set of challenges around it. Let's touch on, on just a few. These are just a few examples on, and I'm guessing that you guys will probably relate to these. These are some very common challenges with managing 
high complexity SaaS applications today. The first one might sound a little bit silly, but when you come to think to think of it, it's at the core of, of, of those problems. And it is, how do we really know what is it that we already have implemented in our system? In so many cases, we're looking at an implementation which has archaeological layers of 5, 10, 15 years of configuration customization changes. Do, you, do we really know uh, what, what is the purpose of all those different workflows? Why do we have 225 roles in our NetSuite uh, account? What's the meaning of all of those thousands of Swiss scripts that are lying around our file cabinet? Do we really need 120 different uh, 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 forms? Transaction forms, for example. After we maybe create some kind of knowledge or create documentation so we actually understand what is it that we already have implemented in our system, how can we tell why a change was made to that customization, by whom, and when? How can we tell that John made, made that change two and a half years ago because of a compliance requirement? Is there a real way to know that? Let's say we did, we do know that now, and that we need to make some change. Let's say that I need to change some saved search. How can we know what will be the impact of such a plain change? Now that impact can be within NetSuite. Let's say we have some switch script which is using that saved search and if now we change the, the type of results that uh, it returns, that switch script might, need, might get broken. Or what would be the impact on other systems? Let's say that there's a restlet using that saved search and that restlet is being consumed by, I don't know, Scaligo, Volcado, some integration platform, maybe your own system. How can we develop changes reliably without impacting production? And this one, that, that's a loaded topic, I know. We've been working a lot with uh, NetSuite uh, uh, implementers. And typically, you would like, you would like to uh, use a sandbox. Sorry about that. You would like to use a sandbox as you develop those changes. But for way too many of us, our sandboxes are not really resembling our production environments meaning that we don't really have a high fidelity sandbox. So when we develop a change in a sandbox, it doesn't reliably, reliably tell us what is going to happen in production. So way too many of us are actually resulting to developing directly in production, which can be, well, dangerous, right? How can we collaboratively review those changes? Most of us are part of a team, right? We're not a one-man show, walking a part of a team, a few developers, a few admins, how can we collaborate? So all of us know what's going on and create typically software development organizations call it collective code ownership. That ownership of our implementation is not of the specific person who touched something. It's of the entire team. The next one is also a fun one. How can we roll back if needed? As you know, in some cases, a bad change makes its way into production. How can we quickly roll it back and roll back only that specific change that needs to be rolled back? Et cetera, et cetera. I won't go over this. It's not even an exhaustive list. It's just, that's a subset of the challenges that we're seeing today for modern NetSuite and other business applications and IT application shops. And by the way, these are very, very similar to classic software development challenges, right? Because the underlying complexity, as I mentioned, is, is pretty much the same. It doesn't matter that it was created using clicks and not using code. The core issue is the same. So, well, it might sound like we have a big problem, right? That there's nothing to be done. Well, luckily, if we go back around 15 or 20 years ago, 
and look at an adjacent area. The way that companies were managing their IT infrastructure, it actually felt very similar to what I just described. Typically, an IT person would start his day with, with a box in his hand, a server, would go down to the data center and start installing it in a very manual, ad hoc process. In a different organization, in the IT organization, with some very long delivery cycles, I remember those horror days when you needed a new server and you got an SLA of 90 days. That led to infrequent releases. Everything needed to be coordinated. And that's basically the, the opposite of Agile, right? And it also led to reduced quality because of all of those unnatural processes. And the way that that was eventually changed was by organizations automating those operational tasks and that representation of the infrastructure with code. And today we call it the as code concept or infrastructure as code in most cases. And that's a fundamental pillar of what we call today modern DevOps when we manage infrastructure and code. It led to faster release cycles, to shorter delivery session, sessions. It increased the quality and is at the core of enabling organizations to practice continuous delivery. Because as part of moving to the cloud, the infrastructure and the code became so much closer that we have to deliver our infrastructure together with on code. So it might sound, okay, why did we take this detour right now to talk about IT infrastructure for a second? But if we look at it, the challenges are pretty much the same as the ones that we're seeing today with managing NetSuite customizations or other business applications configurations. So maybe we can use similar solutions in order to tackle the same problems. Now, before we do that, let's try and understand why does as code really matter? And that's just a subset of the values that we get by start using as code principles when managing our configurations or customizations. The first one, by the way, code is a very scary word, right? But code is just text with structure. So it is textual and there's some structure, some semantics to it. So the first thing that it allows us to do is to version control that code, meaning that we can always know what is that version that we have, what changes are being made to it, why, and we can always roll back to a previous version. It is also an enabler for autom automatic tools, such as linters and static analysis tools to enforce consistency, as well as to analyze our code and, for example, to bubble up dependencies in that saved search example that I gave earlier on. It enables us to create more modular implementation. Everything becomes much more predictable, repeatable, and consistent because, for example, let's say that we have a version that we have deployed to our um, development sandbox. That same representation of that version can be deployed to our UAT. And once it is approved, that same version can be deployed to our production, meaning that now our different environments are not unique snowflakes. And we can get to that desired state when we have a high fidelity sandbox representing our production. Having everything in code also makes everything much more collaborative because as a team, we don't need to talk about screenshots. We can actually point to a document and talk about it. And with software developers, we typically discuss the bus factor. The bus factor, for those who are not familiar with it, is, well, it's a little bit morbid, but it's how many, how many team members in, in the team needs can be hit by a bus while still allowing us to maintain the knowledge that we need in order to run our system. If we do not have proper collaboration, that bus factor is typically one because every area is owned by a single team member. By creating this kind of collaboration over code, we can reduce this, the, this bus factor. Having everything represented by code, and so having a textual representation for our config, 
is also an enabler for AI large language models to understand our implementation and help. As we all know, as LLMs popularized by ChatGPT burst into the popular uh, uh, domain in the last year or so, they're really, really great with understanding text. Code is text. So if we would like for an LLM to help us in our day-to-day, -day, we need a way to fit it. And the most natural way to do that is by using a text representation of our customizations. So unfortunately, it seems like that pure no-code is actually holding us back from benefiting from two of the most significant advances in IT in the past 15 years that I just mentioned. The first one is DevOps, and the second is AI. And this observation is really at the core of what we're doing in Salto. And what we're preaching for is to instead, let's imagine a world where we still use no code to develop because that same motivation to enable the less technical non-developer uh, team members to contribute and customize, it is valid and is core to the usage of these business applications. But we need to use pro code techniques in order to manage our applications. All right. Now I'm going to go over some of the benefits that we can gain from DevOps and AI in this context. And then we'll, we're going to see examples in the context of NetSuite customizations for both benefits of DevOps and AI that are enabled by having such a texture representation, a code representation. Let's start with DevOps. So first of all, having such a clear and complete textual representation of our implementation, both the declarative part and our code, right, our Swift scripts, it, in, it will enable visibility and easily answer what is implemented because all of a sudden you could control F or command F and easily search the entire configuration base. We can version control that representation in a source control system such as Git. I'm hoping that many of you are already familiar with Git, but Git is, in case you're not familiar, you can think of it as a time machine for text files. It basically enables you to snapshot that version that you have at any point in time and understand what was changed by whom and why. It enables code analysis tools to answer questions on dependencies and change impact. We'll see that in a bit. As well as to create shared sure, sure responsibility within the team. Within the team, everyone can become aware of all the different and major changes. It is, an, it is an enabler for always developing in high fidelity sandboxes because that same version, that same code can be deployed across the different environments, meaning that we're not impacting production anymore and we're not testing on a non-representative setup. It is an enabler for reviews before something gets deployed to production. Typically in software development, we, we use pull requests, that they, that's the GitHub term, but there are different terms for that, meaning that the change proposal basically becomes that diff, those changes in code that can be reviewed and can be approved. It also enables us to automate the promotion of changes from one environment to another, from dev to UAT to prod, using very simple primitives which are commonly used in software development world. And for the more advanced organizations, it can enable us to practice automation, which typically called CI/CD, stands for continuous integration, continuous delivery, or continuous deployment. Rollback becomes easy. It's basically reverting to a previous version and deploying. Maintaining a proper paper trail for changes, which can be extremely important for compliance reasons become as easy as tying a change request, for example, from a ticketing system like Jira, to a commit to a change in Git. Now, again, all of these benefits stem from the fact that we have this texture representation all of a sudden. What can we do with AI? 
given this text representation. So we can ask a large language uh, model, an LLM, such as GPT, there are many others, to explain our configuration or customization instead of trying to realize what a very complicated workflow is doing. Those LLMs are really good at actually understanding text and describing them in a human language. It can summarize recent changes to the setup. I'll show you examples for both of these very soon. So let's say that we can ask an LLM to explain what has changed in your NetSuite setup in the last two weeks and create an executive summary so we can share it with the different stakeholders. It can predict the impact of certain changes. It can generate customizations from textual prompt. For those of you who've been playing with some of the um, copilot like tools, as you probably know, LLMs have been being used to create software in the past uh, couple of years with varying degree of success. But such a, just as we can use them to create code, as our customizations are represented by code, we can use them to generate customizations. For example, to create a saved search, to create a workflow, to edit a workflow. We can use them to generate diagrams, to describe whatever, for example, for a workflow. I'll show an example for that in a bit as well. To explain deployment errors, suggest solutions. Now, there's no black magic here. All of those are basically enabled by the fact that we can feed such an LLM formal texture representation of our customizations. And we're just benefiting from that huge advancement that the AI community has brought to the entire industry. Now, before we go into some examples, it's important to note that everything that we discussed so far is actually not NetSuite specific. All of those challenges, and we've been working in Salto with Yes, Nets with uh, Teams, but also Salesforce Teams and, and Zendesk and Jira and Okta. And their challenges are pretty much the same. It might be surprising for, for a second, but eventually a Jira administrator cares. Yeah, in the context of product management or ITSM, but how can she copy changes from a sandbox to production or roll back or understand what will be the impact of a change? Just like a Zendesk admin, although that's in the context of customer support, and just like a Salesforce admin in the context of sales, or just like a Zora admin in the context of uh, billing, right? Their challenges are pretty much the same. So as an industry, we should have a standard way to manage those configurations across our, across our entire stack. There is no sense in reinventing the wheel for every application again and again, because as I said, we have tens, if not hundreds of those. All right. So after, I think we're, by now we're convinced that using code, a code representation for a config is, is a good way, is a good idea. Let's see what can we do with that. Now, the examples that I'm going to give are, are using Salto. Um, there's in some cases, there are some other ways to do that. For example, using uh, SDF. Um, I think the important part to take from this session is the core ID of start using a formal presentation of your implementation. All right, first thing, we can very easily represent everything as code, right? Uh, because eventually the different uh, customization and configuration elements are accessible using SDF or APIs. Here we can see a representation of a transaction form. This is the knuckle language. This is the language which powers a salto. All right, so far, nice. That's, that can power some of the things that I mentioned earlier on. But well, as some of us, as I mentioned, may be a little bit less technical. We can also very easily render this metadata in a much more friendly way. So here is that same transaction form and we can see all of its different fields and all of uh, uh, these are the main fields and the field groups. And we can very easily see uh, what's going on here 
we can see the different roles which are uh, assigned to this transaction form, etc. We can also very easily understand dependencies. Again, looking at the same uh, transaction form, we can see that might be the wrong video. Uh, just a second. So given a transaction form, given any configuration element uh, in NetSuite, you can very easily see what is it using and what is using it in order for us to be able to easily plan changes. We can do that because those interdependencies are basically coded in our configuration. We can also monitor that configuration for certain changes for because those changes are typically just changes to those text files. So we can easily model something like, well, when there's an addition of a new workflow, which is basically a creation of a new file of a certain type, send me an alert, etc. We just, by the way, released a few really nice videos on this on YouTube. Now, as we have this textual presentation, we can also very easily compare different environments. Here we can see a comparison between my development and our production uh, uh, NetSuite uh, accounts. We can see all of the different modifications of, for example, we can see that there is an adult form, which is different, and we can see exactly what is different between these two environments. This can be very hard to do unless we have a textual representation, a code representation of those environments. We can version control everything. Here, for example, we can see that we have a version for every different uh, change that we had in our account. And we can also very easily deploy changes by basically just selecting those changes that we'd like to deploy and deploy them from UAT to production. No need to remember exactly what is it that we change that we change or what is it that uh, or some manual steps or the dependencies, etc. We can just automate all of those, right? Basically selecting and deploying from one environment to the next, to the next, to the next, manually or, or automatically. Looking at AI, you can see this button here that I have uh, on every configuration element uh, in Salto. We can explain it. In this case, we're explaining a workflow and the model basically outputs an overview, the details of this workflow, and a summary of this workflow. We can also ask it that just to diagram it. So just getting an overview and a diagram of the different states and the different uh, workflow here. We can do it basically for every flow-like customization. We can also ask the AI to summarize changes. In this case, we asked it to create a weekly digest for everything that is changed in a NetSuite environment in a specific uh, week. Uh, some of our customers call it uh, an automatic uh, a change log. Um, it can be quite tedious to create these manually, right? And there's no reason for that because as we have captured in code all of those different changes, that's a classic task for an AI model to, to deal with. All right, so everything I just shared with you, well, it's, it's not science fiction and it's actually achievable today. So as I mentioned, I'm the co-founder CTO of Salta. We, that's a company that we started in 2019. And the interesting part here is that those capabilities that, that I just shared are being used by hundreds of different uh, organizations that use us. There's a sample set here today. That's not something that is five years from now, right? You can do these today with your NetSuite uh, accounts as well as with other applications. And within our customer base, there are small companies and huge Fortune 100 companies. Um, so it's really achievable today. To recap, some things to take from this, some, the takeaway from this session, if I may, is first of all, that just using no code, we're basically missing out on modern innovation. So we can use no code to develop, but then translate to code to enable DevOps and AI capabilities. 
We can do this today with Sauto. Some of this can be done with native tooling, for example, using SDF to codify the configuration. Using ChatGPT, you can try and take a definition of some configuration elements and craft some prompts and try ChatGPT. Start using AI models in your day-to-day. -day. Lastly, before we go into some questions, um, what are the best ways to stay in touch? First of all, our website, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Uh, we're mostly active on, on LinkedIn. We have a free learning platform called SaltoLip. You can see the QR code here, which offers free uh, video courses on becoming better NetSuite administrators and developers. It touches on CI CD, it touches on some NetSuite fundamentals. It is not Salto specific. There's great general content for NetSuite administrators and developers. We also have a free tier. If you sign up for our uh, free trial, you can trial Salto, but you can also continue using it for free. Uh, all of those impact analysis and visibility features are part of that. And in general, we're always happy to hear from our customers and from the community uh, at large. Uh, we can go to some uh, questions uh, uh, now. Um, all right. So the first question that I got was, what's an example of something AI can do in this instance? So we gave a few, a few examples. Um, and I think that these are still relatively early days of using AI in general and in the context of business applications. From our experiments, it can be fairly accurate when describing and explaining a configuration element, mostly because the knowledge base on NetSuite in the wild is relatively, um, is relatively big. So it is explaining quite well. It is also summarizing quite well. And I think that uh, we would see over time more and more uh, advances uh, with that. Second question uh, that I got, uh, what kind of access permissions do I need to give to Salto for it to work? That's a great example. Uh, that's a great question, sorry. Uh, typically Salto um, is using the user's credentials. Um, so, if you're going to use Salto in order to deploy changes, et cetera, these will be admin uh, credentials. Um, just as you needed to be able to read all the different customizations as well as deploy uh, those changes. It doesn't have to be your admin user, but typically it will have to have similar um, permissions. Um, another question, question that I got was that, Salto seems to be well integrated with all those features explained, but how would you solve this one without Salto? I guess multiple integrations, so sort. Yeah. So uh, SDF can be used for uh, for some of these, uh, especially around um, change management, CI CD of code. It can be a little bit more challenges with more challenging with the other parts, like workflows and forms and uh, roles. Um, but at least to create that baseline visibility, SDF can be used to some extent. It does require some learning curve. Um, by the way, uh, beneath the hood, Salto is using SDF as well as a custom suite script, a suite app that we created that extends it. Other than SDF, I talk with quite a few NetSuite admins and developers that are using ChatGPT in your day to day. Um, and they're using that, they're basically using the API in order to read a JSON or XML of, uh, of, of the configuration element. Then, then they crafted their own, uh, uh, prompt in order to mostly explain sometimes also to, to edit. So you give it a configuration element with instructions on what would you like it to, to do to it. Um, so, uh, I've seen success with those as well in some organizations. Um, 
And you would typically also need to integrate with a Git provider. So let's say GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket. So you can build some of these on your own. Um, and obviously you could, all, you could also, our recommendation would be to use Salter because there is no need to reinvent the wheel in many cases. And we've put a lot of uh, thought into the best ways to, to integrate all of these. Um, all right, so it seems like we went over all the different questions. Now, this session was also recorded and we'll share the link uh, uh, after the after the webinar. Um, so thank you all so much for attending. And I hope this was a for, uh, informative and useful. And uh, We'll see you in our next webinar. Thank you so much.